Hey, everybody. I'm already seeing some comments here. Welcome to this session uh, with my friend Gigi Fernandez, 17-time Grand Slam champion. Pretty decent guest to have on the uh, the summit. Uh, I'll turn the camera uh, briefly on myself uh, as we see Gigi here. But um, yeah, welcome again, and it's a pleasure to have everybody on. Uh, we were on just you know a few minutes ago with uh, Jeff Greenwald, and we're here again to talk more about the mental game. Uh, the, ro the roadmap to setting and achieving your tennis goals is what we're going to try to focus on today, but we'll obviously take your questions. Uh, so hello to Janice. Hello to Paul. But um, uh, Gigi, welcome. And how are you doing? Hi, Aaron. How are you? I'm good. I am uh, just finished camp with Martina about two hours ago here in Tampa. So we had uh, 16 participants uh, over three days. Uh, and we had a, we had a ball. Other than Martina going to Saddlebrook instead of Innisbrook, <laughs> everything went well. <laughs> oh man, that is funny. Yeah, yeah uh, I've, I've done yeah, that there. before with with directions. But um, yeah, again, you know, I really appreciate you coming on. You know, as Gigi just said, like she's been doing like a week long camp, and uh, you know, she graciously is still giving her time uh, for you all and myself today. So that that's really fantastic. Uh, Hey, Jude, how are you? Hey, Jerry, what's going on? So before we launch in, I just do want to give a, a quick thanks to our sponsor, uh, Slinger Bag. So I have a Slinger Bag. I really like it a lot. It's a great quality bag by itself and also uh, functions really well to help me improve my game and especially been uh, helpful during these times. So big thanks to Slinger Bag. Thank you so much for the support. So, um, so uh, Gigi, uh, I guess the first place I want to start off with is um, why, you know, because I've seen you talk about goals, uh, setting and achieving goals. Why are is setting goals uh, very important for uh, even club, layer, club players like ourselves? Yeah, I mean, I think if you don't have goals for what you're doing, um, you kind of go about life aimlessly. You're just kind of you know, roaming around with no clear direction or clear path. I like to use an analogy of would you get in your car and start to drive for no reason? Like you probably wouldn't unless you had a brand new car and you want to see how fast it was or something. But then that would be your goal to see how fast the car was. Well, you, you, you really need to know where you're going, how to get there, and you need to know that you've arrived. Um, and with tennis, um, you know, sort of having something to look forward to and something that gets you motivated to do that extra practice, um, I always found that. Uh, was really helpful for me. Even today, I still have uh, goals that I want to achieve with my tennis career or from the teaching side. Like I made it a goal about three years ago or two years ago, I made it a goal to hit all 50 states with my G Method clinics. And that kind of keeps me going. You know, I, I, I'm about 30 down, 20 to go. But if I didn't have that goal, I probably would maybe stop or maybe not be so motivated to go to the, the states that I have not visited yet. But because I have that goal, I'm going to continue to pursue it and it'll kind of keep me motivated to continue to do it. And also on the, from the tennis perspective, when you're actually on the court playing, it's very important to have goals because you want to have things to focus on during the match, whether it's, you know, getting your first serve in or make, getting 75% of your first serves in, moving your feet for a whole match, uh, being aggressive or being defensive, depending on what your style of play is, keeping, you know, keeping the ball on the court, make 10 balls in a row, whatever your goals are, you have goals that hopefully if you achieve these goals during the match result in the win. A lot of times people have a goal, which is to win the match. And that really cannot be your goal because winning the match happens on the last point of the match. But what are you going to do between now and the last point that if you do successfully will, will help you uh, achieve the goals. And then the last thing that's uh, I, the last reason that I like goals is because tennis is really a brutal sport. Like one person wins, one person loses. There, this is not a team sport where you could, you know, maybe your teammates didn't play well, or if you're having a bad day, you can sit on the bench, or about you're not feeling good for 10 minutes, you sit on the bench. There's, it's really you out there against them, and someone's going to win, someone's going to lose, and the loser always feels bad. You know, it's no fun to lose. You're, if you care about what you're doing, you're going to feel bad when you lose. But if you have goals that you achieved in the match, even if you lost, you're going to feel a little bit better because you can see I didn't win the match, but I did these three things better. And if I keep doing these three things better, hopefully all over time, I'm going to start winning these matches. Yeah. Great stuff, Gigi. So uh, you kind of alluded to, to, you know, what bad goals I guess are, or at least one of them. 
but what's an example of a goal that's that you had set in the past and then you know you figured out you know afterwards that that didn't really end up helping you maybe it wasn't an ideal goal to be setting um you know i never i don't think there's such a thing as a bad goal um and maybe the, maybe the way that i set my goals was helpful and i should explain it like when i when i said it when i set my goals i set them there they were timed so i had zero to six months six months to two years two year to ten years and then undefined terms so if you you know what might be a bad goal like to you know win nationals or but that might take two years so if you put it in the zero to six months that could be a bad goal but if you put it in the two to ten years then maybe you can win nationals in two to ten years but but what i liked or what i was taught and the way i was um you know, define my goals was I had two categories within that time frame. I had the attainable goals. And these are things that I knew I could do. Like I knew I could work out three times a week. I knew I could eat healthy. I knew I could hit a bucket of surfs once a week, but then I had the seemingly unattainable goals. And these are goals that I thought there's no way I'm ever going to achieve this. And these were things like win a grand slam, win a gold medal, be number one in the world. You know, when I wrote that, I had no idea that I was going to have the career that I was going to have, but because I had those goals, um, I ended up achieving them, right? But if I put them in the attainable categories, it's not realistic when you're, you know, 50 in the world to think you're going to win a Grand Slam. But if you put it over here, then it just wasn't so much pressure. Um, and then other things like, that's kind of funny. I have two things in, in my seemingly unattainable, undefined term life goal, which was to own a private plane and own a private island. <laughs> and I still don't have either, but I'm still trying. <laughs> and maybe someday it'll happen. Who knows? But it, you know, stuff that keeps keeps you motivated, you know, and keeps you excited about getting up every day and getting to work and you know, continuing to travel the country, doing camps and clinics, and continuing to share my knowledge because I have these other goals that I want to achieve. So that's that's why I do it. Yeah, I love that. And uh, we talked before the uh, the summit and or you know the mm -hmm. session, and and you've been having some camps that you've been hosting, and they've been going really finally. well. Finally, so, yeah. Yeah, it's been tough. Well, I mean, it's it's been um, – I I just had this camp with Martina. We started Wednesday, but I had not worked since – I had worked one day in January and had not worked since November, the first week in November. So, um, you know, with the, the pandemic, um, I had a couple camps in October and November, but then we started to spike again, so I had to cancel a couple uh, a couple camps, um, and people were just not willing to travel. So, I, I, you know, the only two camps that I was able to – and actually, these came from last year that – Camp with Martina and Camp with Tracy Austin that I had last month were, were from last year. Um, so we got were able to uh, conduct both of those and have them for the people. But I have not been able to sell anything new uh, because we're still sort of in that, or I had not been able to until now. I just I just um, offered um, camps in Aspen this summer. I decided I was going to spend the summer in Aspen and put out a couple of camps, um, three day camps there. And those were very, very successful people. Want to be in Aspen in the summer who wouldn't, right? So I, I organized um, some camps and clinics there. So I'm excited to spend the summer in Aspen. Yeah, for sure. That That's, that's gonna be a lot of fun. Uh, hello to a few more people. William, greetings from Ireland. Looking forward to a good chat from Gigi. Uh, Gene says, looking forward to some more good advice from you, Gigi. Uh, Jerry says, gg come up uh to alaska summer only you can contact me to set up a clinic nice yes <laughs> uh gg at gg fernandez tennis send me an email i figured alaska was going to be my last state but right. i'm going to come to alaska and do a clinic and i'm going to be you know when it gets down to the last one i'll just go i probably won't charge anything for the last one it's like <laughs> just get me to alaska and and nice. i'll do it for free <laughs> nice nice so John has a question here, a uh, nice one. What do you think about process goals versus outcome goals? So I, I'm a better believer on process goals. You know, what I was saying, that the outcome goal, if you're, the outcome would be to win a match. That happens um, way down the road, if I'm understanding correctly. Um, you, you always have to be in the moment in tennis. You can only control this moment that you're playing, this point that you're playing, uh, you know, not even the next point or the game or the set. That's all you can control in tennis. So, so something that's happening during the match. So move your feet for the whole match. Communicate with your partner. Get your first serve in. Serve in volley. Return and come in. Whatever it is that you're working on. Uh, hit 10 balls in a row before going for a winner. Um, 
you know, what, if you're working on your slice backhand or your, your one-hander backhand or your topspin backhand, try to practice those things in a match. So definitely goals are better um, placed in the process category as opposed to in the outcome category. The outcome happens as a, as a result of you achieving your process goals. Gotcha. Thanks, Gigi. So you did mention kind of the importance of uh, properly distinguishing whether a goal is realistic uh, and attainable. So how do we actually do that to, to ensure that we do, um, you know, categorize it that, you know, we're not miscategorizing it like, oh, yeah, we can definitely achieve this, but it's actually like a big stretch goal. I mean, so you have to really know yourself and, and kind of be realistic of where you are. I mean, if you're if you're, you know, a, a new 3-0 to make 3-5 nationals in two years, it's not going to happen. <laughs> It's just not going to happen, right? But if, but, but it could happen in ten years, right? So you could maybe put that in the seemingly unattainable category. If you, I mean, a rating change is a great goal to to achieve a, cha a rating change. So if you're three five, you want to be four. If you're four, you want to be four five, and that takes time. You know, it's, it's very hard to do that in in, uh, in less than two years. So to me, like a, a rating change, if you're wanting to achieve rating change, that's a two to ten year goal. And then you have in your six month goal, you have play tennis three times a week or four times a week or every day, um, take what, a lesson once a week, uh, try to play one competitive match a week, try to travel to a tournament so you could play you know, a series of matches. Um, so, you, so these are your short-term goals that you could do that hopefully will help you achieve the long-term long, long -term goals. Yeah, thanks for that, Gigi. So, so one thing that a lot of us struggle with is, you know, we'll write down – Goals will be very excited, you know, one day, maybe after listening to this, so you'll write a bunch of goals down, categorize them. But then all of a sudden, or maybe in like a, a few days, you just kind of forget about it, you know, and then you forget about that sheet of paper that you wrote the goals on. So um, how can we prevent this from happening and stay consistent with actually working on our goals and then achieving them? So the good news is that technology these days you can do anything with technology. Like I was doing this before we had technology. So you could set a reminder on your phone for once a month, uh, or you could have a, a calendar appointment once a month that says review goals. And it pops up on the you know third of every month, the third day of every month, review your goals. So that can remind you. Or you know what I used to sit down with my coach and review my goals every six months. So if I write, if I write them today, six months from today, I would go back and look at the zero to six month goals and then the six to six months to two year goals. And usually the zero to six month goals come off, right? And then the some of the two to 10 year goals would get moved up to the zero to six. So I was constantly moving them. You can do it in an Excel sheet. Um, so, you know, you can easily move things around uh, or you could do it on Word doc or whatever and print it out and, what one thing I used to do was um, I would put notes in the refrigerator. You know, I would, I would tag little magnets to the refrigerator for things. Um, especially, you know, for me, what, for me when I was playing, eating healthy and staying fit was always a struggle. You know, for every most players, I mean, most women struggle with that. I, you know, and I'm a Hispanic, so I have that propensity to eat bad food. Um, unfortunately, that didn't mean that in a bad way, but we eat a lot of fried sure, food. Sure. I ate a lot of fried foods growing up. Um, so it was always you know, reminding myself that I needed to work out five times a week and that I needed to eat healthy. So I put it on the refrigerator. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Gigi. Um, and I like staying hydrated there. <laughs> um, let's see. Yeah. Um, yeah, I need to. So, Bruce, uh, I enjoyed hearing people's perspectives that is, as it appears both of you do, too. Can you discuss what intrigues you in tennis now when it involves older or younger players or people from other countries? So I guess but it intrigues me? Nothing. I don't, I'm not intrigued by tennis at all. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not. I, I, mean, I don't watch tennis. I really don't. It's terrible. Um, I don't – right now I'm not super excited about it. You know, I, I'm a huge Roger Rafa fan. I follow their careers, and I love watching them play. Um, I've always been a fan of Serena. I've always loved her passion. I mean, she's controversial. Some people don't like her. I just, as a competitor, I, I just always loved her, her will. She never, never quits. And, uh, but you know, I like, I like Ashley Barty. Um, but I don't, I don't so much, I don't really pay attention to it. I, I, I'll watch the, 
the semis and the finals of a Grand Slam, but I have not watched uh, tennis without fans. I have a hard time watching tennis without fans. It's kind of weird, <laughs> you know. It's I don't know. Yeah. So, you know, and I'm I'm. I'm a mom, you know, I'm a mom of 12 year old kids. So we don't sit around, around the living room watching tennis. That's not what we do. Right. I'm usually Very running difficult. around with, like a chicken with my head cut off. Um, <laughs> You know, and I'm of late. I'm very intrigued with pickleball. I'll tell you, I've been playing a lot of pickleball lately. Um, I played in the pickleball U.S. Open on Monday, um, and I think wow. tennis can actually learn a lot from the sport. I don't know if you've ever been around a pickleball tournament, but I was I was mesmerized. I couldn't believe like there was three thousand people in this event all playing. So that we had the pros and the three O's and the three fives and the fours and the four fives all playing in the same arenas. Like I was playing next to a four old match, you know, and I was playing in the pro division. Um, but what I really liked about it is that when you play and you, you play your match and you hang out and you play it on the match, you hang out. So you're there for like hours on end, you know, and ten, so it becomes a social event, right? And you meet people and you're friends with your competitors. It's, um, you know, with tennis, when you go to a tennis tournament, I don't like that you go, you play a match and then you leave. And you go back to your hotel room and then you come back the next day and you play another match and you leave and you come back to so there's never that kind of hanging around mentality and there's um and it's because of the format because we play two out of three sets it can take three you know three hours to play two out of three sets whereas with pickleball the matches take 25 30 minutes and they're intense but then you're off the court and you come back on so i feel like we're kind of missing the ball a little bit in tennis um as to how we run events you know and, and also watching my kid, my, one of my daughters play soccer, you know, watching youth soccer events, you know, I go to the youth soccer events and there is thousands and thousands and thousands of kids at a, at a youth soccer event. And it's, you know, we don't have that in tennis. It's like when I was running event, t- tennis events, junior events in Connecticut, and they'd be like the 16 or a 32 draw, you know, so 16 kids or 32 kids. And you can't have these thousands and thousands of, of people participating. So I think, I think we're missing something in tennis to attract more, more of the masses. So that was kind of, didn't answer the question, but sort of answered the question why I'm not sort of intrigued by what we're doing in tennis right now. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's super interesting. I think it's really important to be able to uh, grow the game and the way, one of the ways to do that is to learn from other sports and, you know, potentially make yes. if, if, make changes and so um that is very interesting i'll have to check out one of these tournaments um yeah i mean the the short i think the short sets i know they're they're controversial and i'm not suggesting that pros should be playing short sets but i think if you could have tournaments league tournaments or you know adult tournaments where you could go and play a bunch of short sets like 10 matches, 10 matches of short sets. You know, I actually played 15 big old matches in one day. I played a tournament that started at 9 a.m. and finished at 6 p.m. And I was there the whole time, and I was pretty much playing the entire time, except maybe I had a half an hour break here, and then we had a, a 45-minute lunch break. So it's like, great, I burned like 4,000 calories. <laughs> you know, it's like, and I had a ball. It, it sounds like torture, you know, but it was it was – really fun but you can never do that in tennis because the matches are it takes too long you know, it's like the match takes three hours and then you have to go recover whereas if you're going these 25 minutes purse you can you can stay out there longer yeah very cool i'll have to experiment with uh with those formats so cool so so jason here hi mirabai and Gigi. hey jason Gigi, you mentioned eating healthier was one of your long-term goals what was your nutrition slash hydration plan like when you were on tour, pre-match, in-match, and post-match? Nutrition and hydration, both? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, so um, hydration, you know, back when I was playing, we, we started having these power drinks, like Cytomax is what I drank. I don't know if that's around any, anymore, but I would drink, um, you know, always, I obviously drank a lot of water. I was This was the, this was the thing when I was playing, hydration. We already knew about it that you had to drink lots of water. Um, and we had this electrolyte re- uh, replacement drinks. Um, so I was constantly drinking water and drinking these electrolyte drinks. Um, and then as far as nutrition, we carbo-loaded. I, I don't know if they do that. Eat protein, eat protein, eat protein. When I was playing, we carbo-loaded. So I was constantly carbo-loading. Um, you know, and I had, I had set patterns of 
eating behaviors that I would follow before matches. So, you know, all it took was eating wrong one time. It cost me a match like that. You never eat wrong again. Like, mm -hmm. right. So, so I knew what I could eat before a match and how many precisely how many hours for me. Um, I didn't want to be on an empty stomach, but I didn't want to be a full stomach. So I usually would eat somewhere around two and a half to three hours before a match. I would have a pretty good sized meal. And then if I got hungry, I would just have like an apple or a bagel or, some kind of snack. Um, you know, the problem sometimes was that you never really knew when you were going to start playing because you're following a match or, and sometimes you're following men's matches. Um, but I, you know, funny, I always, if you cover loaded the night before, I, I always er erred on the side of not eating enough close to the match. Like I didn't want to have a big meal before a match. I'd rather eat a, play on an empty stomach. If I had cover loaded the night before, I'd rather eat, eat, uh, play on an empty stomach than play on a full stomach. Yeah, I remember having like this uh, nice big plate of Persian food and tons of rice, and then I was like snoozing during the match. It was terrible. So yeah, and then you probably <laughs> lost. And you say, "I'll never do that again." Yeah, right? got destroyed. I started serving yeah. mauling when I had like never done that before. <laughs> so, oh, that's terrible. Uh, yeah, yeah, good times. Um, let's see. So Ned says. I've created online yearly plan, track hours of training, coaches' objectives, and ranking goals. So that's that's fantastic to hear that. Um, right. yeah. yeah, definitely. And uh, Janice has this question. Um, so as we get older, physically, we have diminishing returns. Can you give me some realistic goals without causing my body to break down? Um, how old is Janice? Hmm. We might have to get that information. Good question. Yes, let us know. Yeah, I see yeah. that. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, as we age, the main, I, you know, and I'm, I'm 57 years old now. Um, I think staying fit is super important. Like I just lost 25 pounds and I feel a thousand times better than I felt even with you know 20 pounds heavier. It's not a lot. It's not like 50 or a hundred pounds, but even just 20 pounds makes a huge difference. Like, like you, if you don't think it matters, 20 pounds, I would, what I would recommend you do is go put 20 pounds in a backpack and put it on your back. So like get a backpack, fill it with 20 pounds of weights and then go play a tennis match or go play a practice match and see how you feel. <laughs> it is hard carrying 20 extra pounds and my knees don't hurt anymore. Um, so, 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 so Janice, my answer is, Make sure you're at a good weight. You know, you're eating healthy. Trying to, you know, I went on a keto diet to lose weight. It's hard to play tennis and keto, but I wasn't playing so much tennis at the time. And I just went on ketosis for a month and lost 15 pounds in three weeks or a month and wow. kept it off. So, yeah. So, keto works. I mean, keto does work because when you think about it, when you're in ketosis, you don't have any carbs. So, when your body needs fuel, it goes to – the fat to get your fuel, right? Because there's no carbs to give it fuel. So it, it's so simply realistic and it's just like science, right? I mean, your body needs, carb is your gas engine. And if you don't have the gas engine, it's gonna go look at somewhere else and where it looks for it isn't the fat. So the fat just came off. I mean, not that I was obese, but I was yeah. getting close to not being super happy or super comfortable. So so yeah, Janice, make sure you're, you're at a good weight and, um, and, you know, and of course, work, you know, I've been lifting, I've been doing a boot camp two days a week for the last six months, um, just to keep your body in alignment. And, you know, tennis is a very right-sided sport or, or one-sided sport. If you're lefty, obviously it's left-sided sport, but if you don't work out or lift weights, you get very unbalanced. So try to get into some kind of workout uh, regime where you're doing lift, doing some light, light or heavy lifting, depending on what you like. And getting some arms, um, arm workouts and kind of full body workouts in there. Love it. Love it. Fantastic. And she is 70, by the way, just to clarify, uh, she clarified. Oh, okay. Thanks Janice. Yeah. yeah. Make sure you stay fit. <laughs> That's right. Number one. Cool. Uh, let's see. So first off, big shout out to Mr. Peter Freeman. Hi, Gigi and Mirabon. Um, great to see you here. A fellow grand slam of the month, uh, you know, uh, host with Gigi. So, that's yeah, that's right. Where is Peter? I don't see him. Oh, is here we he go. Here? I, I put it on the screen. Yeah, he's a little bit down, down there. Um, so oh, yeah, well, okay. what's going on, Peter? Hi, Peter. <laughs> 
Great to see you. So, yeah, so, to, so Peter and I do what the last Monday of every month, we do what we call the Grand Slam Call of the Month. So we, uh, inv- I invite a past Grand Slam champion and we kind of chit chat. And so we had, we've had Lindsay Davenport, Jim Courier, um, Patrick McEnroe, Mark Woodford, and then we're having, we have Pam Shriver on uh, next Monday. So these are, they have been kind of fun, these calls. Yeah, pretty, pretty sweet names here. So uh, fantastic. And let's see, we've got more questions. So Elliot, hello. Uh, what do you do when you are working hard and then stuck at a level or even make some progress and then find yourself going backwards a month down the road? Um, so, you know, progress is not linear. Like you don't progress, you don't progress like this. You're going to progress like this. Right. So you are going to have downs in your um, in your progress because you try new things. Right. And when you change a stroke or when you're trying something new, it might not feel good right away. You actually get worse before you get better. It's very common to get worse before you get, you get better on something. And you just got to stick with it. You know, you got to stick with it because at some point you're going to have that aha moment. And then the whole thing is going to kind of get wrapped together a little bow and it's, it's going to make sense. You just got to stick with it. Yeah, definitely. You, uh, I, I remember this picture of like somebody who's, um, they're like striking. I forgot what it was like, um, some box or gold or whatever it was, but basically like, you know, you can strike like a thousand times and something won't open, but then, and you walk away little, did you know that, you know, it would only take like one more strike to open up everything. So Right. Yes. Yeah, like you're yeah. trying to open a bottle of something and you can't open it. You can't open it. You give it to someone else and they go, er, no problem. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> yeah, because yeah. you did all the work. So you just got to keep going. You just got to not not try not to get discouraged. Um, and, you know, and and also sometimes, too, when you're trying to get better, a lot of times it's good to go play matches against worse opponents against people inferior to you like it's very common for players that are developing their games to you know go back down and play satellite satellite events so you could get some confidence you know because if you're trying to get better and trying to play with better players and you keep getting beat and you keep getting beat that can be kind of discouraging so so go back down and play players that you know play um maybe maybe play down on the lineup if you're playing one or two and losing as you're Coach, you play you three or four, just so you can get some some wins under your belt. So you can start feeling good and um, and just stick with it. Yeah, awesome, great stuff, uh, Gigi. So let's see, Jay, look okay, again. My goals are simple: improve my technique, coordination, tactics, just to stay in the point. Then try to take control of the point. Above all, tire them out by long points. Oh, that's those, good. Those are, yeah, those are good. Those are good. I like it. Um, let's see. Gene, oh, interesting. Uh, could pi- could playing pickleball be a detriment to tennis technique? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, they're definitely different, but it's like, I mean, if you can play golf and play tennis, or if you could do something other than play tennis, right? I mean, you don't, we're not professionals, right? So, yeah, um, funny because I just played pickleball tournament on Monday, so I've been playing a lot of pickleball. And then the first time I played in this camp, at first, it was like, "Whoa, what happened there?" I framed the first ball. It's like, "Okay, I got a longer racket," and then your 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 body, I mean, your mind processes it, you know. And by by today, I was playing great. I played great today. So it's just a matter of where you find your enjoyment, you know, and where you find your 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 pleasure. You know, what's fun for you? And for me, playing pickleball is fun. So even if it if I don't play great for half a day or a couple, you know, half an hour or whatever that it, for to me, it's worth it. Awesome. Yeah. Very cool. Going to try it myself. Uh, let's see. Hey. So what's that? Sorry. No, I was reading the next comment that he Christopher is right. Tennis is a challenging sport to learn and master and beginners become frustrated and shift to other sports. Yeah. Pickable is a lot easier to play. No question about it. Like mm. uh, a lot easier to be good at pickable than it is to be good at tennis. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Let's see here. What else do we have? Um, Saleh, hello. Uh, evening, GG. Greetings from Serbia. Um, tend and befriend. <laughs> um, so let's see. Does it work on WTA as emotional response? Uh, what does that mean? I'm trying to think. Saleh, can you give us more three. more context maybe? Um, or maybe rephrase, Saleh, and we can get back to it. 
Um, maybe it's in the context of like a previous point we made. I'm not sure, but yeah, just let us know. Um, okay. Gordon! Mr. Gordon, Gordon in yes. the house. That's right. That's yeah, right. Gordon wants to know how to stay motivated. Um, Motivated into target when no tournaments and group and you just go in. Um, you can play practice matches, you know, play practice matches and play for something. Like put money on the line. Like put twenty bar or twenty pounds on there. Like let's see, you put twenty pounds, your partner puts twenty pounds, winner takes all. That'll give you a little motivation. Uh just when there's something riding uh riding on the line, it could be who pays for dinner, it could be who picks up the balls, you know, anything, anything that that motivates you. Um you yeah, know, I understand it's, it's been fr very frustrating not to be able to compete because of COVID. I'm over it. Everybody's over COVID. But hopefully uh, we're starting to get to the other side. I've been vaccinated. Hopefully lots of you all have been vaccinated and we can start getting to the other side. Right, right. Yes, definitely. Um, let's see here. What else do we have? Uh, Constance, uh, sorry if I mispronounced, uh, but how can we play well with a new doubles partner in a women's league uh, many times you're placed in a doubles match with somebody you don't know. So what do you think? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, I mean, I if I was going to play with somebody I didn't know, like at minimum, like I would want to ask my captain for their email um, and I would communicate before stepping on the court. Like I'd want to have some kind of communication before stepping on the court. And you want to find out some basic things like what side they prefer, What's their better ground stroke? What's their better volley? Uh, are they better at the net or the baseline? Um, do they do they are they emotional? Like, how, what, what's their, do they like to be talked to? Do they like chat or do they like quiet? Like, you really have to um, try to get to know your partner as much as possible. Um, but you can't do that if you just walk on the court and say, "Hey, let's play." <laughs> you know, it's really hard, right? Even to decide who plays what side. So, at minimum, I would say. Try to communicate with them before before the the match um, by email or by text or maybe a phone call if that's feasible. Uh, if all else fails, um, you know, doubles is doubles, and usually if you understand the dynamic of a doubles point and the geometry of a of the doubles court, if if you have two people who understand that, they should be able to play doubles well together. The problem is that there's a lot of bad doubles instruction in our country and a lot of people playing bad doubles not covering the court the optimal way so if you get one of those people that are insistent on covering their alley then you're in for a long day because if you have someone who likes to cover their alley then you're covering 90 percent of the court and i that's no fun <laughs> whatsoever but some people will not will not give it up because they don't want to get passed on the alley and and if you, if you play somebody like that i say thank you very much find a new partner <laughs> <laughs> because you're not just not going to be a good team if you're obsessed with covering your own your alley. Yeah, for sure. And also check out uh, the GG method. <laughs> so exactly. The GG method, which really shouldn't be called the GG method, it should be just called doubles one on one because it is how you play doubles, how you play winning doubles. You know, it's interesting that I have had this is the second camp I've had with Martina, and I didn't <clears throat> call her and talk to her about the GG method or what I was going to teach her. Um, and she didn't want to, she didn't ask to understand what we were working on for 10 hours. We had no communication about it. And we got to the camp and I said this to the campers, like Martina, I have not spoken about anything that you're going to learn over the next 10 hours. And guess what? We didn't have one disagreement, not one. We agreed on absolutely everything. Uh -huh. So, because it is how you play doubles. <laughs> it's right. like, Play it and simple. And if people try to play it a different way, good luck. Good luck. Because it just you can you'll be okay, but you won't be great. Yeah, there's so. certain fundamentals you gotta gotta yeah. implement. So let's yeah. see. Uh Saleh again. I mean, oh. Like the, like like the geometry of the court is geometry of the court is not changing. The court is seven it's uh Oh my God, how big is the tennis court? 72 by 36, that's not gonna change. And the angles are the angles. If a person's standing in a certain position, there's certain angles and there's and that they can hand, there's ones they can nod, there's high percentage and low percentage. And that's non-negotiable, what's high percentage and what's low percentage. And um, you know, and I I didn't know high and low percentage when I first started playing tennis. I just played, I was kind of natural and I just kind of knew what I was 
swimming boats. And it took a coach really explaining it to me and really teaching me what was high percentage, what was low percentage to understand when I was hitting low percentage shots um, and stop doing it or stop doing it when it mattered. So it made a huge difference in, in my game. Yeah. Tennis is so much fun. I mean, just so much to learn and correct. And, uh, you know, it's so, so great when you, when you figure out strategies from, you know, great coaches like Gigi and then you implement it and it works. It's, it's really satisfying. Um, yeah. so let's, let's see. So Marymount should make one more summit minimum just for doubles and veterans league support. Oh man, I'm going to need to have some rest first and then we can think about that. <laughs> you guys have but. no idea how much work it is to put these conferences together. I mean, I, I, I feel your pain. This online, um, it seems very simple to just come on here and talk for an hour. It is, there's so much behind, going on behind the scenes. That, so good job, Mirabon and, and Peter, if he's still here, he does one in October that is also very successful. And yeah, it's pretty much a year long venture to get it to this one week. So yeah. thank you for doing that. Oh, thank you, Gigi. Really appreciate the kind words. And yeah, our friend Peter uh, has a great uh, online conference too in the fall. So, uh, Sally, definitely want to check that out. Uh, but uh, let's see here. What else do we have? Okay, Laurel. Um, what regimen, uh, parentheses, lessons, drilling, workouts, matches, do you recommend for a player to improve? It's a loaded one. Oh, how much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> much time as you want, Gigi. Um, much time. Um, well, I mean, if you really want to improve in tennis, I think you have to play every day. Like if you, if you're really that invested in improving, you got to play tennis every day. Uh, take one day off a week, so take Sundays off, but you got to go out there and play at least one and a half hours to two hours every day. And if you're a junior trying to improve, or if you're a retired adult, it has time all the time in the world. You got to play tennis every single day. Um, now what you do in those sessions, um, you know, Always, you always want to work on your strengths. Sometimes people forget their strengths, but but you have to um, work on your weaknesses. You have to really try to improve your weaknesses. Sometimes people just get caught up with working on their weaknesses because there's a weakness, but they forget to strengthen their strengths. Um, so you know, and how you break the, the time apart, like maybe spend 30 minutes hitting cross court and forehands and cross court backhands so 50 minutes each way then hit down the line forehands down the line backhands uh if depending if you're doing singles or doubles i don't know it's this is such a long answer i do do two cross court one down the line with a partner so you're going side to side if you're doing doubles you can do cross court singles on the, or cross, cross court doubles on the single score to across from each other and then you got to serve return volleys i mean it's it's involved right um so but, but I think the one thing is like, if you're really invested in improving your game and you're super into it, uh, improving, you have to play every day if you want to get better quickly. Yeah, definitely got to put in the work. Um, great stuff. Let's see. What else do we have? Um, Gordon again, uh, no ITF, like the gambling idea I motivated. That's, that's good to hear Gordon. Uh, let's see, Samantha. Oh yeah. Okay. What do you do when your doubles partner isn't really interested in communicating with you during a match? Wow, that's a tough one. Um, I wouldn't play with her again, for sure. I mean, I guess the question is why maybe Samantha, maybe Samantha's talking too much. And some people don't like to talk. You know, some people just like to focus. Maybe she's um, not playing well, and or maybe Samantha's talking too much to her. That's a tough one to answer, but but you have to respect their wishes. If they don't want to talk, then you got to go about it yourself uh, and try to figure out, you know, do your best you can. But I mean, in 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 the end, you're not going to be a great team if you're not both communicating. So if one person's talking, or one person wants to communicate, the other one doesn't, you're not going to be a great team. So I would say, um, get through the match and maybe talk to her after and ask her why she didn't want to communicate. And in the end, just Find a new partner. Yeah, I think that's the solution, pretty much. So uh, yeah, right. That, Gigi. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's the best one. Uh, let's see. All right, Constance will check out the GG method. There you go. Excellent. Um, cool, cool. So let's see what else we got. Uh, Richard, I get the social and early enjoyment potential of pickleball, but tennis players I see who start playing it develop a leaning upper body rotational axis 
which ends up hurting their tennis. So any other thoughts about the dichotomy there? What do you mean by leaning upper body rotational axis? Richard, what does that mean? I mean, they're leaning. Like, so when you play in pickleball, yeah, you kind of, in pickleball, you're always crunched down and you hit everything in front of you, but I don't know what it means by, um, by, I don't understand that question, but, but does pickleball hurt your tennis? Um, it can, but it can also help your movement. There's definitely, believe it or not, there's more movement in pickleball than there is in tennis. I burn way more calories playing pickleball than I ever um, burn playing tennis. And I think it's because wow. in tennis there's a lot of downtime. You know, you like, you have to go get the balls that are far away. So you walk to the balls. Um, if your partner's returning, sometimes you just don't even hit the ball. Um, so you're kind of standing there and then you walk back. It's a lot, long walk back to the return spot, long, relatively long as opposed to um, pickleball, but pickleball is very fast moving. I mean, you're always, it's just fast. I mean, it's not it's a misconception that this is for old people. Yes, old people play pickleball, but the way the pros play it, they're ripping the ball and they're, you know, moving. And so I don't, I don't see it as an old person sport at the pro level. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Let's see what else we got here. Uh, let's see. Crunch time tennis con magnificent. Agreed. Um, Samantha, how do you get it out of your head that you can't beat people who always win matches? Good question. Um, so you, you know, you're always trying to play the ball. You're not playing the opponent. Like you're, you, it doesn't really matter who you're playing. Um, if you can just think of playing, playing points, you know, when I, I played my best matches, when I was just telling myself that I had to win the next point. So whenever the point ended, I would tell myself, I got to win the next point. And that point ended, I got to win the next point. I got to win the next point. I got to win the next point. So I was always, um, really didn't matter who was on the other side of the court. I was just simply trying to win the next point. Um, and then I think her next question was interesting. Like, um, if you, can you actually play every day? Isn't that how you get injured? Um, you can play every day you have to work your way up to playing every day. That's what pros do. We play tennis every day. Um, sometimes we don't even take a day off. So it is possible to do it, um, but start slow. Like don't, don't today don't start playing six days in a row, but you could play maybe every other day next week. And then the week after that play at a fourth day. So you play two days in a row, day off, two days in a row, day off, two days in a row, day off. Uh, and eventually you gradually work your way up to three days in a row, day off, three days in a row, day off, four days in a row, day off, four, four days in a row, day off. Um, and then you have to stretch, you have to ice, you have to uh, eat right, you know, you have to um, and listen to your body. If you start to get hurt then, or if something starts to bother you, then uh, it's a constant readjustment, like when you're, when you're trying to get better at something. Yeah, definitely. Experimenting and doing all the right things. Let's see what else we have. Um, oh, okay. Sally has a rephrase here. How hard is it to control emotions and be friendly with females on tour, but still have your focus on goals? So first off, where are you, like, what was the friendliness level there? Or were you just super serious like uh, Sharapova? <laughs> um, no, it's not definitely Sharapova because I'm, a uh, lively person by nature and I'm an extrovert. Um, nice. So I was, I, you can be friendly. It's funny. You can be very friendly with your, with the, and people are very friendly, but there's a difference between friendly and being a friend, right? So there's a lot of acquaintances and a lot of being kind of nice to people and being friendly with them. Um, but they're not true friends, you know, like the people you're competing against, you don't really let them, into your fully into your world because you're competing against them and it, you, you don't want them to know something that might they might be able to use against you um, in a in a match situation. So um, so yeah, I mean, I always felt like once the match and like once it, I walked into the court, once I stepped into the boundaries of the court, then the relationship, whatever the relationship I had with the person I was playing with sort of ended and they became my opponent and simply my opponent. So at that point I'm focusing on my goals and I'm being intense and playing. But when we came off the court, then, um, then I could be friendly again. Beautiful. That's the way to do it. 
Awesome. So let's see here. Uh, Ned. Oh, some more requests here. Hi, Gigi. Would you come to Ontario, Canada for camps? We love tennis here up north. Sure, I'll come to Ontario after I hit all 50 states. But no, I, I actually talked to somebody in Toronto about going there sometime. Um, but yeah, once COVID ends um, and everybody's kind of feeling more comfortable traveling, um, I'm sure I, I would love to do that. Awesome. Yeah, I've probably got some hookups for you too there if, if uh, you're interested. Uh, let's see here. Samantha, uh, thanks. Perfect. Richard Posture. Uh, Christopher, again, what were the keys to your and Natasha's success as a doubles team? Um, lots of things. Uh, starting with communication, we were, we were excellent communicators. We always, I always knew where Natasha was coming from, what she was doing or not doing. I always knew she was going to hit the ball. I knew her, we knew each other's games. So, so she's very pretty, you know, to be a good doubles player, you have to be, be predictable. You have, your partner has to know what you're doing. There's nothing worse than your partner trying a shot out of nowhere. And you're like, where did that come from? And then you're, you're, they hit a shot that exposes you, uh, makes you look bad. Um, because you didn't know that she was going to try that shot. So I always knew what she was going to do. Um, great hands. We both had uh, excellent hand-eye coordination. So we were able to um, win, win rallies at the net, that, you know, quick reflex at rallies at the net. Um, and then we understood, we really understood high percentage doubles, like what, it, what it's like, what, what shots are high percentage and what are not. And, um, and then this having the mental, uh, strength to continue to hit the high percentage shot time and time again. And I think that's really the difference between the great players and the good players. Like sometimes under pressure, the people who succumb to the pressure go for the wrong shot at the wrong time. They're not, they just keep hitting the same shot over and over again. They try to go for something more fancy or they try to come up with something new or different instead of just doing the same thing over and over again that, you know, has worked throughout the match. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, Gigi. So let's see what else we have. Laurel, you're a great teacher. I look forward to meeting you at one of your future clinics. Awesome. Uh, Thank let's you. see. Samantha says thanks. All right, Mariana, nice question here. How much time would you set as a weekly goal to hit with a ball machine? Will hitting too much with the old heavy tennis balls actually hurt my game? Um, no, I don't think so. I, I would... I think 30 minutes on a ball machine is plenty of time. Um, if that's all you could do, I mean, an hour on a ball machine is a lot. You get a lot of balls, but it depends on what you're working on. And if you're working on a new stroke, uh, an hour on a slow paced ball machine. So you have time uh, between each shot to kind of recover. Um, if you're working on your technique on a shot, an hour is okay. But you know, most ball machines are like rapid fire ball after ball after ball. So I would say 30 minutes. Um, and I don't think it'll, I don't think it will hurt your game at all. I mean, it may hit your arm. Right? If you get like, um, you might, you might um, not be able to start out with doing an hour at a time, but, but in any, anytime you're trying to uh, up the tempo or up anything that you're doing, you have to wean into it. You know, you can't all of a sudden say, like I was saying, you don't want to tomorrow start playing tennis every day. You want to maybe start with the ball machine 15 minutes and then 20 and then 30 and then you know, slowly but surely you work your way up to an hour, but you can't just all of a sudden out of nowhere go hit, you know, 10,000 balls in, one, in a one-hour session or, you know, 3,000 balls, however many balls you get in one hour. It's a lot of a lot of hitting, so be careful with that. Yeah, for sure. Gradual, um, you know, increments is the way to go. And uh, for ball machines, I want to check that slinger bag out. Uh, very good one. Yeah, right? <laughs> Yeah, it's quality. Um, all right, let's see. Um, okay, Jay, look, good one. How did you bounce back after the match you lost uh, with your doubles partner? What were the goals in meshing with the new partner? Hmm. Um, so really bouncing back, you know, in, the, in on tour, doubles partners are, um, you know, we, Natasha and I did had our own coaches. So we didn't have a coach that we worked with. So as far as bouncing back after loss, it was really my job to make myself bounce back. And it was her job to make herself bounce back. Like we didn't affect each other. Like I wasn't trying to help her bounce back from the loss and she wasn't trying to help me. We actually never really talked about it. Um, but you know, we're both professionals. So that's what you do when you're a pro because 
you lose every week. When I turned pro was that, that I lost every week. And I had a very successful junior career in Puerto Rico where I was number one in my age group and the two above. Uh, so at 12, I was number one in 12, 14, 16s. And at 14, 14, 16, 18s, I mean, I lost, there was only like two or three people that I would ever lose to in Puerto Rico. So I would lose, I kind of with my, in, in a hand, the times so I'd lost a year, uh, probably with one hand in Puerto Rico. And then I went to college um, and as a freshman, I lost two matches all year. And then I went to nationals and I made it to the finals. Um, so I've lost, I mean, I don't think I lost 20 times in my life when I turned pro. And then what happens when you turn pro? You lose every single week, twice, singles and doubles, loss. So, so if you, so at first I uh, had a hard time. I didn't know how to handle it, you know, and I was almost going to quit. I was four years into my career and I was uh, going to quit because I was not, you know, doing well, was not happy. And, um, and then I met Jim Lair, who changed my life, Dr. Jim Lair, a sports psychologist. And I started working on the mental part of the game and, and kind of learn that you know losing is a learning experience and you learn more from from losses than it's actually good to lose you know because you learn from your losses when you win it's like oh one again one again one again great what are you working on i don't know because i won so what do i have to work <laughs> on but if you lose it's like okay i lost why did i lose they were fitter they hit better forehands they, what did they do that was better and then you go work on that so it's it's the only way really to improve is to, with when you're losing yeah love it definitely Let's see. Um, Peter. Hello, Peter. Hi, Gigi. Regarding the cause of pro chronic injuries, it is it is mainly because of overtraining or some other minor technical flaws overused daily. Thanks. Um, you know, I actually feel like pros are very fit these days, more so than when I was playing. Um, you know, when I was playing, we had just instituted the age eligibility rule. A, a little bit of the um, injury for pros back in the 90s was that people were turning pro too young so undeveloped uh, fully developed bodies like 13 14 year olds turning pro um, my daughter's 12 i cannot even imagine <laughs> like one year being a professional athlete is ridiculous really when you think about it um i would never have it but um but i think uh it's not back clearly not poor technique because poor technique does not hold up under pressure um, so I think the ones that are getting hurt, maybe don't have the, the, um, team that around them, that the right team around them, you know, like you don't hear really hear. I mean, of course, overuse like Rogers 30, whatever, almost, I don't know how Roger is, but he's very old. So having, I mean, <laughs> I didn't mean that in a bad way, but yeah. the fact that he has bad knees isn't surprising because, you know, you're pounding, 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 pounding the knees, um, whether you're fit or not, that's just cartilage and, you know, and you um it's it's hard on your body you know we we wreck our bodies there's no question about it i mean i wrecked my body um and you pay the price but wouldn't change it for the world right <laughs> so 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 to answer your question peter i think it's it's probably more from overtraining and poor recovery or poor um recovery for whatever reason they're not recovering properly than it is um, poor technique Gotcha. Thanks, Gigi. Let's see. So, Jason, if you're going through a technique change and tracking via video analysis, do you recommend taking a break from matches? If so, how long of a break from matches to avoid old habits? Um, if you're taking, if you're making a technique change, um, I would. Yeah. I mean, if you're if you're fully depends on what technique change you're making, right? If you're fully reworking an entirely new stroke or changing your grip, um, I would say stop competing. But if you're adding a stroke to your repertoire, like, like I learned to hit topspin while on tour. So I had my reliable slice backhand that I used. And then as I was learning topspin, uh, maybe I would try it once a match. I'll try it on this one or I'll try it twice. Uh, then I started twice as a match and then tw once a game, twice a game. And then until it became, I could hit it all the time. Right. But I didn't, I couldn't, I didn't have the luxury of, of quitting or stopping uh, while I developed this, this tops and backhand. So again, it depends a little bit on 
what exact stroke are you trying to um, if you grip on either your forehand or your backhand that yes you have to um, take some time off competing because see what happens when you're trying to change the stroke if I'm thinking back to when I would go through this is that you have the tendency to then go back to the old one because that one still works right yeah. and then you get confused between what well, should I hold this grip or should I hold that grip um, should I try this swing path or that swing path right so and you don't want to have that in a match. You want to say, okay, this is the one I'm trying and this is the one I'm sticking to and uh, good or bad, this this is the one. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, so I would definitely stop playing. Gotcha. Thanks, Gigi. So this is kind of funny. We've got a question from Paul that says, any tips on turning up intensity in a match? And then we have a question from Gordon that says, any tips on reducing intensity in a match? <laughs> so I don't know how we want oh, to go. that's funny. Yeah. Uh, how do you well, I don't know. That? I mean, I don't know that you would. I don't know that, um, Gordon. I don't. I don't. I, I can't think of any positive reason to reduce intensity in a match. So reduce. So yeah, the adrenaline. He's talking about. But you can't stop adrenaline. Adrenaline is, is a physiological. Uh, it's a physiological uh, process of your body that releases adrenaline. And you just have to understand that you have to know that when your adrenaline's kicking in, that you're going to swing harder, further, be more aggressive. Um, so then you have to counter that. You have to tell yourself, slow down, take it easy. You know, this goes to like a, when I talk about the role back to mental dominance, for those of you who have heard me talk about what the physiology of fight or flight uh, is at play when you're playing, because, uh, when you're in a stressful situation, your body is reacting in what we call the physiology of fight or flight. And there's certain things that happen to your body that you can't, you can't change them. And things like when you feel the butterflies in the stomach and you have muscle tightness or you have um, the need to go to the bathroom or you have, you know, you get tight, um, nausea, diarrhea, uh, these are all results of the physiology of flight response. That is a normal physiological reaction that happens to a human being when they're under stress. So if you run into a bear in the woods, you're gonna have this physiological response. And if you're playing tennis and you're in a stressful situation, you're gonna have this physiological response. And you can't stop it, but what you do is you tell yourself things to counter whatever happens to you under pressure. Because some people overplay and some people underplay. Some people wanna fight the bear and some people wanna run away or shoot the bear and some people want to just run away from it. So in tennis, that some people overplay and some people underplay under pressure. Some people try to hit winners too soon, go for too much, hit two reserves, they get overly aggressive and some people freeze. Like I used to freeze. I, my, my feet would stop. Um, my arm would get tight and heavy and I couldn't swing through, but some people just try to hit winners. They hit the ball harder. It's like, whoa, what's happening here? So you just have to, I always was telling myself, okay, you got to move your feet triple time. You got to be more aggressive. You're going to be more active. And if you're like, order, I think needs to do the reverse, like just slow down, take it easy. One point at a time, like have a little meditation session in your head before the point starts, take a couple deep breaths and slow and slow yourself down. Yeah. Thanks, Gigi. Um, I should have asked you this before we started, <laughs> but um, any, uh, you know, cut off at six or a couple yeah, more? Yeah, or a couple more minutes. Yeah, a couple more minutes. Okay, okay, sure. So we'll take this question here then. Um, what was your shot to hit, and did you hit? Did you have your favorite side forehand or backhand? Yeah, I played the outside. My, my favorite shot was my backhand. Um, I had a really good backhand return, and I had a really good backhand cross-court angle. Um, so I could roll my backhand short angle and kind of get someone stretching. And then I could, um, I mean, you have, a, on tour you have, a, I had all three. I could hit down, I could hit through the middle. Um, and, um, and, I'm, and, and yeah, my backhand was, it's funny because I learned my backhand on tour. I learned to hit off the backhand while on tour. Um, and it became my best shot. My forehand, I, I had, didn't have more technical problems with my forehand than I did with my backhand. Interesting stuff. So thanks, Gigi. So um, I want to ask you, um, you know, after listening to this session, uh, what advice would you give um, the audience to to help them 
you know, achieve their, their tennis goals? Like what's the next step? Um, well, first you got to write them down and then you have to commit, uh, a certain block of time each week towards achieving those goals, whether it's, you know, one hour a week, three hours a week, five hours a week, you know, how many times a day are you going to play or not play, et cetera. So, um, so, uh, and then reassess, constantly reassess goals, life changes all the time, goals are changed all the time, things you achieve goals. So you have to keep, keep uh, having new goals. And then whatever you do, don't ever quit and don't, don't ever give up. Um, never say die. Like I never, I have never given up in my entire life. Well, actually, I shouldn't say that I have given up, but I don't ever give up. Don't ever give up. Um, you never know. Like sometimes when the worst, you have your worst moment and before you know it around the corner is comes greatness, you know, and then 1994, I was going to re retire from singles. It's going to be my last year playing singles. Um, I lost nine first rounds in a row starting in wow. January. First round, first round, first round, first round. I got to Wimbledon. I was ranked 99th. I was the last player to get in. And I made the semifinals of Wimbledon in singles, almost beat Martina to make it to the finals and uh, ended up getting back into the top 30 and having two more years of a singles career. So, so just when it looks really bad, something great could be around the corner. That's right. That is definitely right. Um, so Gigi, maybe I'll sneak in one more if it's okay. Jude asks in, in doubles, do you serve with power or placement? Placement. Placement. Because, there you go. because yeah, because, um, if you serve with power, you're not, you know, you want to, you, you don't want to miss your first serve. There's an inverse relationship with power and control. The harder you serve, the less accurate you're going to be for everybody. Um, and if you have to, if your opponent hits a second serve, if you have to hit a second to your opponent, the returners get aggressive mindsets in on second serves. So they're, so they're going to come in or put you in trouble, drive it at your net player. Um, but also the harder you hit the ball, the less time you have to get to the net for your first volley. So if you're serving in volley and you hit it hard, it's going back harder, you're not going to get to the service line, which is where you need to be hitting your first volley from. So if you place it well and you get somebody stretch or reaching and you hit like a three-quarter pace serve, it gives you more time to get to the net. In fact, I, I never hit I never hit my serve 100% in doubles until I had a match point or a game point. Um, and then I, and I had this one serve that I hit that I was wide, uh, wide on the ad side that was – a really great serve that I developed that if, when I hit it, it was ungettable, you know, it was in, it was hot. It was in a hundred percent serve. It was probably 95% of my full power, but it was more about where I placed it. So definitely placement over power in doubles. Love it. Awesome. Thanks Gigi. So just real quick, I do want to let people know about, um, the opportunity to get the, uh, all access pass. Um, so if you want, and if you enjoyed this lesson and you want to get lifetime access to this, so you can rewatch it whenever you like, as well as, you know, all 45 plus other ones, uh, you can get the all access pass and, you know, it includes all these things here. So not only the, the, the 45 plus videos actually, but also the audio MP3 files, which you can download and listen to wherever you like, which is hugely popular with, with a lot of people. Um, you, you'll also get the transcripts of all the summit sessions, which has been taking a long time for my team to, uh, to transcribe. It's just, it's a lot of work, um, but we're bringing it to you uh, for free with all access pass. You also get the summit implementation worksheet. Uh, and you'll get uh, exclusive access to the Summit Facebook group, which has been a really a lot of fun to interact with everybody uh, who has the access pass there. Um, also, VIP live streams with me and guest coaches uh, on occasion, and then special deals and discounts from our partners. So uh, I put in a such link. a deal. Yeah, it is. It is quite a deal, actually. It, just a lot of content, and I put in Gigi's link here. So uh, would be highly appreciated if you'd like to support. Uh, Gigi, for all the great time and content that she's given us today, uh, to go through that link in the chat, and you will get all this uh, great stuff uh, from us. So um, thank you. Yeah, and then if I have like, a couple more minutes from my end, um, I yes. do camps here in Tampa, um, three-day camps. I do them at Indian Wells. Uh, I do an Indian Wells tournament, which I hear is not going to happen in October, sadly, but um, – mm -hmm. But will happen in March of next year. Um, I'm going to spend the summer in Aspen doing camps there too, and clinics, 
Um, and I also do trips to Grand Slam and the Labor Cup. The Labor Cup is going to happen with fans. That's in, everybody wants to go to the Labor Cup, check out uh, my website, ggfernandestennis.com uh, has, is my website. And there's all kinds of information in there about fun ways to get better at doubles. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, Gigi, should, should everyone like to, to keep getting uh, more information from you, I guess, go to your website and then sign up for, yeah. for the newsletter? Yeah. Yeah, I have a, I, I do a monthly tip. Um, sometimes, a couple times a month, I send out free tips. So I, I do send a lot of free stuff. And when we're doing these promotions uh, from other online people, um, online tennis providers, I, I'll, I'll we usually all share our free content so you'll get a lot of a lot of free information out there um so yeah so you can uh go to gfernandestennis.com and there's a link in there to join the list and um get in the network and hopefully if you ever want to come to a camp to improve your doubles for a couple days or i also travel like i said earlier i travel around the country um doing clinics if i come to an area near you you can find out about those also while while there Love it. Love it. Um, well, well, hey, thank you, Gigi. everybody. Yeah. Thank you so much. Some great comments. Thanks, Jason, Jay, look, Samantha, everyone. Um, and it's, it's a real pleasure to uh, be able to serve you with the content and thank you so much, Gigi, everybody check out her content and uh, we have links below this video to, for you to do that. So uh, thanks a lot, Gigi, and hope to connect again very soon. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye everyone. Thanks.